Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I welcome you to another episode of our fascinating series, Sirat Rasul, Lessons and Morals, where we discuss the life and times, the teachings and message, the matters and morals of the greatest human being who ever walked the face of this earth, and that is our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We were discussing the Battle of Uhud, and to remind you of the layout of the land before we begin the events of the day, remember we had said that Uhud was a huge mountain range and that the Prophet ﷺ took advantage of this little structure protruding from the mountain and he camped the Muslims right over here such that they could not be attacked from any side. It's a natural protection and the Prophet ﷺ came right over here and he camped all of his camp was over here and the only area that was left unprotected, of course this is the area of attack, the only area that is left unprotected is from the back. And so he positioned 50 people on a small mountain, which we cannot see in this map, but if you ever go there, you will see it. It is called the mountain of Ainain. Now it is called the mountain of Aruma or the mountain of the archers. He placed 50 archers here and he said, make sure that they don't attack us from this side because this is all empty and they're attacking this way. So he said, make sure they don't attack us from this side. And he began lining up all of the Muslims in ranks like he had done in the battle of Badr. And he made sure that every single person was in his proper place. So much so that if somebody was in appropriate place, he would take him and place him in another locality. And also he checked their strengths and their weaknesses. And he discovered quite a few youngsters that had managed to sneak into the army. Why did they sneak into the army? Because they wanted to help the Muslims. You see, when the elders that were hypocrites like Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, when they are turning their backs and fleeing away, you have young, brave men, hearts filled of Iman and Taqwa. People such as Abdullah, the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Zayd, the son of Thabit, Usama, the son of, of Zayd. You have Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. All of these men, at this time, they weren't men, they were teenagers. Between the ages of 11, 12, 13, 14. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had put an age limit of 15 and above. You could not participate if you were below 15. 15 was the age limit that he put to participate in the battle of Uhud. And yet there were five or six of these teenagers below 15. Look at their Iman. And every single one of them is a name who is famous and well known in the seerah. Because when you have a 12 year old whose heart is so much full of Iman that he wants to participate at the battle of Uhud. What do you think will happen when he's 22 and 32 and 42 and 62? These are the major names of the second generation of the Sahaba, the younger generation of the Sahaba, not the Abu Bakrs and Umars, but rather the Abdullah ibn Umar and the Zayd ibn Thabits and the Usama ibn Zaids. And so the Prophet turned them away and he refused to allow anybody below the age of 15. Anybody 14 or younger had to go back. But one of them, Rafi ibn Khadij, he said, O Messenger of Allah, I am 14, but I can shoot an arrow better than the best of anybody amongst you. Check me out, try me, and I will shoot an arrow better than anybody. And so indeed, another man was called, and they had a shooting match on the morning of the battle of Uhud. And Rafi ibn Khadij demonstrated that he was a very precise marksman, that he could shoot an arrow better than any adult. And so the Prophet ﷺ allowed him to remain with another group of archers that were present at the battle of Uhud. Look at his iman and enthusiasm. When the news spread amongst this group of little teenagers, when the news spread that Rafi ibn Khadij was allowed to remain, some of them became quite irritated. And one of them, and this was Samura ibn Jundub, Samura ibn Jundub, he returned back to the camp and he said, O Messenger of Allah, how come you allow him to remain and you don't allow me? I am 14 too, but I am stronger than Rafi ibn Khadij. If he can throw a bow and arrow, then I can beat Rafi ibn Khadij up. So when the Prophet sallallahu saw this vigor and enthusiasm, he made exceptions for these 14 year olds just on the verge of 15. It's not as if they're little kids. And of course, in those days, 15 was considered to be basically a young adult. 
And so he allowed exceptions to these two. And really what we are impressed with here is the zeal and the iman of these young children. How we wish that our own children, how we wish that our own youngsters were filled with love of Allah and his messenger, were filled with bravery, were filled with a zeal to help this religion out. And these are the stories that we should tell our youngsters in order to motivate them to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to sacrifice for his sake. These are our predecessors, how we wish we could follow in their footsteps. So soon afterwards, the mushrikun or the pagans began to arrive and they made their way through this through all of the uh, the plantations and trees and they made their way and they camped facing the Muslim army on the other side of Uhud. And so it was that on the 15th of Shawwal in the third year of the Hijrah, basically one year and one month after the Battle of Badr, the two armies faced one another once again, the army of Islam and the army of Kufr. And once again, the two armies were going to battle it out. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had given very, very specific instructions about how to proceed in the battle. And he also had told the archers to remain as they were. And he told the archers, as we said last time, no matter what you see, you must remain as you are. Do not leave your places. Even if you see the enemy killing us, even if you see the birds eating the flesh of your fellow Muslims, do not move until I send for you. And indeed the Muslims charged. And as they charged, they made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And initially the victory was theirs. So much so that despite their small quantity, despite their poor preparation, they only had three days to prepare. They had pure and raw iman. And that was what led them through to the victory. And the Quraysh and the Mushrikun, just like they did at Badr, just like they did a year and a month ago, they were turning their backs and running away. So much so that Al-Bara ibn Azib, the famous companion, Al-Bara ibn Azib, he said, it was only a short time that we fought them until we saw they turning their backs and fleeing. You see, these people are fighting without real motivation. How can you motivate yourself when you're not fighting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What motivation is there? Money cannot motivate you to kill yourself. What's the point of money? These people are cowards. They have no faith. They have no ultimate loyalty except to their own self-interest. And when the Muslims come and their loyalty is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no army can face that type of zeal and courage. So the Quraysh turned their backs and they began to flee. So much so that Al-Bara ibn Azib said that when we fought them, they turned their backs and fled. And I even saw the women that had come with them I even saw their women running away from their tents when they saw their armies being defeated. I saw them running out up the mountain, lifting up their skirts to run up the mountains. And I saw their ankle bracelets. You know, the women of those times, they wore bracelets around their ankles. I could see their ankle bracelets because they had lifted their skirts up to run up the mountains out of fear of being captured. And I remember clearly that Hind bint Utbah, Hind is the wife of Abu Sufyan, Hind bint Utbah and all of her female friends, they were running in all directions out of fear of the Muslim army. So this clearly shows us that in the beginning, the victory was for the Muslims. And Khalid ibn Walid, who was portioned on the right side of the flank, he tried more than once to launch an offensive from the behind, from the back of the Muslim army. But because of the archers, he was showered down with arrows and he had to turn back and bring his flank back until finally even he decided to retreat with his army and his flank. Therefore, all three of the groups of the Quraysh, remember that they were headed by Abu Sufyan in the front and Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl on the left and Khalid ibn Walid on the right. All three of them, they turned their backs and they fled and they regrouped many, many miles behind this. And this shows us that initially the victory was clearly for the Muslims. Now what happened? Well, what happened was that when the Quraysh fled, they left behind most of what they had come with. What had they come with? Hundreds of horses. And a horse is a very, very expensive possession. Thousands of camels, swords, bows and arrows, lots of metal items that are used for the war. They left behind large containers of food, many things that can be used by the Muslims. So when the Muslims saw this and they saw the Quraysh flee, some of them called out, so much war booty, al-ghanima, 
so much to take. And the news spread amongst the Muslim camp. There is so much booty to be had, so much horses to acquire. And so many of the Muslims, when they saw the Quraysh leave, now we're talking about an hour or two after the battle, all the Quraysh have fled. They gave up their weapons, they put their weapons down, and they began to collect this booty and bring it back to their camp. Instead of becoming interested in the fight and protecting their backs, they became more interested in acquiring this money that was in front of them. We need to take a short break. When we come back, we'll continue talking about the events of the Battle of Uhud. Please stay with us. Countries of the world ban bullying. They fight it in their schools and universities. A lot of us are being bullied differently every single day. Some come up to us and say, do this, while others say, don't you dare. Some say this is halal, halal, halal. while others say, nope, this is haram. haram. Are, you confused? are you confused? Do you feel lost? Join me in Umdat al Ahkam where with the grace of Allah, we will learn the proper knowledge from the Quran and from the Sunnah, which would help stop this kind of bullying. Join Asim Al-Hakim in Umdatul Ahkam tonight at 10.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 6.30 a.m. India on Peace TV. <laughs> Say he is Allah one and only. Allah, the absolute and eternal. He begets not, nor is he begotten. There is nothing like him. Focus on the source of wisdom. The Quran is a magnet. And the Sunnah is a revelation. Islam had the solution right from the beginning. We apply that and the problem is solved. Focus on the solution for our world. There is no man on the face of earth. His life was narrated to us like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Poor, rich, white, black, Arab, non-Arab. Everybody say the same word. Obey Allah, obey the messenger. Focus on the Akhirah. Tawbah is mandatory upon each and every Muslim. Success for the Muslim is having the correct belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has power over all things. Has power over all things. Focus on the facts and realities that motivate the world towards Islam in Islam in Focus today at 7 p.m. and repeat telecast at 10 a.m. India on Peace TV. Welcome back. We were talking about the Battle of Uhud and we had mentioned that the initial offensive that the Muslims launched against the Quraysh was a complete of those who also retreated was Khalid ibn al-Walid. But Khalid ibn al-Walid retreated only to a safe distance and he continued to monitor from afar what exactly is happening. And he noticed that the Muslims were acting as if the battle was over and that they had abandoned their formulated lines and ranks. You see, instead of coming together like an army, it is as if the Muslims thought this is another repeat of Badr, and that just like everybody fled and that's it, this too now is uh, the end of the situation. So they had let go of their guard, some of them were unarmed, and they began to become busy with compiling the war booty, with going around here and there to the tents that had been left by the Quraysh, to the ghanima, to the horses, to all of the weaponry, and they began getting them together. People were now interested in the booty, and the entire structure of the Muslim army was now completely collapsed. And so Khalid ibn al-Walid saw what was happening. And you know Khalid ibn al-Walid was the greatest military commander of the Arabs. And that was why he managed to do what he had done in the battle of Uhud. And when he became a Muslim and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him to Islam, he became the greatest general the Muslims had ever seen. This is Khalid ibn al-Walid. And Khalid ibn al-Walid saw what is happening. And he then immediately regrouped together a small group of people, probably from all three flanks. 
Because remember, when they're fleeing, this is 3,000 strong. It's not as if they're all disappeared now. You have groups of people here and there. So he gathers together as many men as he can. And as he is seeing this and he tries to launch an offensive now, even the biggest gift is given to him. He sees that those archers at the top of the mountain that were there, he sees their number dwindle and he sees them coming down the mountain. Now, let us stop here and go quickly over to the mountain. What is happening? How can these people leave the mountain? You see, when the army fled and the Muslims began compiling and gathering together all of this money, the archers, many of whom were new, did not know the legal rulings pertaining to war booty, the archers felt left out. And the archers felt, why can't we get a share of this money? They saw one person taking a horse, another one taking a sword, another one taking a large shield. And remember, these are people, they don't have lots of money, they don't have lots of cash flowing in. They have been stripped of much of their money from the Quraysh, and they're living very difficult lives. So they see people walking away with lots of booty, and had they been patient, all of this booty actually goes to one pile and is distributed evenly to all of the people, as we already mentioned in the Battle of Badr. If they had been patient, they would have all gotten an equal share of this amount. But it was just the greed of money. And this is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says himself in the Quran, that you loved what you saw of this world. So when these archers saw this, they said, let us go collect some as well. How come they can get it and not us? Abdullah ibn Jubair said, how can you leave your positions until the Prophet ﷺ tells us? They responded back, but there is no enemy. They've all gone. And these people are getting booty. Let us get it as well. And so a group of them became impetuous and became rash. And they wanted to go down and get some of this money. But Abdullah ibn Jubair said, I can never leave until the Prophet ﷺ leaves. And he did not give them permission to leave. But they disobeyed their own ruler and leader. They disobeyed the chief of the archers, and that was Abdullah ibn Jubayr, the one whom the Prophet had placed as their leader. And they all, 40 of them out of the 50, 40 of them simply abandoned that position, thinking that the war was over, and thinking that the Quraysh had completely fled. And so Khalid ibn al-Walid is monitoring all of this from the distance, and he sees that there are hardly anybody left on top of the mountain. And so Khalid ibn al-Walid, knows that the place to attack the Muslims from is now from the back. It is from the rear flank. Let us go from behind because now there are very few people left. And once again, to remind you of the map uh, that we can see what exactly is happening here. This is the locality of the Muslims. The archers are located in the center of this circle here. Khalid ibn Walid is, we don't know exactly where, but perhaps somewhere far away. He's monitoring what's happening. Now he regroups. Now. Some modern historians are of the opinion that Khalid ibn al-Walid actually went around the entire mountain and attacked them from here. But if you really consider this, if he had done this, it would have taken at least two and a half hours. Most likely what he did was that he went from around this area and attacked from here. Everybody agrees that he attacked from this area. The question arises, did he go around the mountain or did he go from in front of the mountain? And what appears to be more likely was the fact that he went from in front of the mountain and he attacked from behind here because this tactic would take half an hour or maybe 20 minutes. And this tactic would take at least two and a half hours or three hours. And it is very probable that all of this occurred in a short span of time. So most likely Khalid ibn Walid actually attacked from the front of the mountain. And he also, this is uh, narrated in our books of history, he also sent men directly to this mountain of Rumat. He sent them up to the top of the mountain to physically kill these 10 archers there. And so Abdullah ibn Jubayr and the 10 who were there, they tried their best to defend, but they were massacred and killed by the forces of Khalid ibn al-Walid. And so Khalid ibn al-Walid managed to bring a force, we don't know of how much, but probably at least 200 men. At least 200 men, he brought in a force from completely an area that the Muslims were not expecting. They were expecting the archers to protect their backs. And they're facing in one direction. And all of a sudden, Khalid ibn Walid is attacking from their complete behind, from the rear. And they were not expecting this at all. And another point, they weren't even ready for now war and battle. They think that the battle is over. So as Khalid ibn Walid charged to meet them, 
that was when that was when complete chaos broke out and the first person to see the coming of Khalid ibn al-Walid was none other than the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam the first person to see Khalid ibn walid was none other than the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he had two choices now he could have fled quickly and run away or he could have shouted out and screamed to warn the other Muslims but by shouting out he would have given his own location away he had two options to run away and flee or to shout out and warn the other Muslims and he chose to warn the other Muslims and so he yelled out as loud as he could O oh Muslims, you're being attacked from behind. O oh Muslims, you're being attacked from behind. And so the Muslims turned around, some of them turning this way, some of them turning that way, and complete chaos ensued. And the forces of Khalid ibn walid managed to inflict a severe blow on the Muslim army. And that was because, as we said, the Muslim army now was not prepared for an attack. We can imagine that by the time the Quraysh have fled and Khalid ibn al-Walid has come back, it has now been in the afternoon, it, most of the day has gone, and they are assuming that the army has now disappeared. Instead, Khalid surprised attacks them. And as the cavalry of Khalid ibn al-Walid is coming closer, the Prophet ﷺ had no choice but to himself flee on a path and a road that many of the Sahaba did not see him take. He, along with those who happened to be around him, Whoever was around him at the time and whoever was around him did not include Abu Bakr or Umar or Uthman or Ali. None of these major companions were with the Prophet at that particular point in time. There were other companions there such as Ubaid Talha ibn Ubaidillah and a few others. They were those who were with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This was the single most dangerous moment for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in fact, in this fleeing and in this going away, he was injured quite severely. One report, it says a spear that was launched by the forces of Khalid ibn al-Walid. It actually entered into his armor because the armors of old, they were made by circular strands. And every strand has a little bit of space in the middle. It's like two links. You can imagine two links like this. And there's lots and lots of strands. And so if the, if the pin or the head of the arrow goes through this there's still the possibility of some damage and that is exactly what happened that one of these arrows or one of these spears or javelins it went into the hole of the armor and it hit the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam right on his cheek and it in fact went through his cheeks and it dislodged one of his premolars one of his tooth actually fell out and the blood was pouring from his face sallallahu alaihi wasallam and him along with a number core group of companions they were forced to make their way up into the mountains and they found a small little area there which was not even a cave it was not even fully uh, protected it was simply an area that had a hiding space behind it it's not a full cave it's just a little protrusion of a rock and you can simply hide behind it and then hope that nobody sees you and so the Prophet ﷺ, along with a few of the people that were with him, they hid behind this cave. And can you imagine the scene? And can you imagine the chaos that ensued? And in this chaos, even a more severe thing happened uh, that really made the Muslims extremely worried and depressed. And that was a rumor was spread that the Prophet ﷺ had been killed. A rumor was spread that the Prophet ﷺ had been killed. How was this rumor spread? Because one of the mushrikeen, one of the pagans, he managed to kill Mus'ab ibn Umair. And Mus'ab ibn Umair was a young man whose skin color resembled that of the Prophet ﷺ. And he was wearing full body armor and his face was covered. So when this pagan killed Mus'ab ibn Umair, and he saw Mus'ab ibn Umair fall, and he saw the eyes and the color of his skin, he assumed that Mus'ab ibn Umair was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he shouted out, Qataltu Muhammadan, I have killed Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course he was mistaken, he was wrong. But he shouted out and this news spread in the ranks of the Muslims and it spread in the ranks of the Quraysh. And of course it had a profound impact on both the Muslims and the Quraysh. As for the Muslims, it completely demoralized them. As for the Muslims, it completely removed the wind from their sails. And as for the Quraysh, 
it gave them a sense of complacency and look at the working and the mysteries of the ways of Allah. It was that rumor that was one of the primary reasons why Khalid ibn al-Walid and others eventually retreated. They thought that the Prophet was dead. And so if they wanted to, they could have decimated and massacred every single last Muslim. But this was a false rumor. It was an incorrect rumor. And in that incorrect rumor, the lives of many Muslims were spared. In that eventually, after a little while, the forces of Khalid ibn Walid, they killed who they could, they injured who they could, and as the Muslims hid, and as the Muslims, other Muslims fought, the forces of Khalid, because they were not full, remember, this was only a portion of the army, the forces of Khalid eventually retreated and left, and this was all from the divine wisdom and plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many are the lessons that we're going to learn in the battle of Uhud. Many of the incidents occurred that are worthy of our attention and discussion. And insha'Allah ta'ala, as we continue our series of lectures about the battle of Uhud, we will mention more of these incidents and more of these wisdoms and lessons and morals and the response of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the verses that were revealed concerning the battle of Uhud. This brings us to the conclusion of today's episode. Insha'Allah ta'ala, I hope to see you next time. Until then, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad Yeah